that's our cue. Um, so I'm Steve Haddock. I'm a researcher over at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And uh, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce Alex Lapidus today for her momentous occasion of her um, master's thesis defense. Um, I'd like to thank Moss Landing for hosting her and also her committee members, um, Tom Connolly, Amanda Kahn, and Corey Garza, who's joining us online today to help shepherd her through this, this process. Um, so I first encountered um, Alex, I think in 2018, she applied for the Ambari Summer Internship. And if there's a really promising student who applies, but they're local, she was at UC Santa Cruz, then I usually, I don't take them as my official intern, but then I reach out to them on the side and say, you know, maybe we can work out some kind of joint research project together. And so I did that with Alex and um, she came on board to help analyze some of our massive trove of video data. Um, but Alex has, she's got like a, a huge varied um, abilities and a background. So when she first started working with me, she had analyzed drone data, drone imagery for Corey, I think, over at Elkhorn SLU. And um, in, with my lab, she did a lot of data processing and R, data cleaning and data wrangling. But she also worked in the video lab at Mbari doing annotations of, of video, expert annotations. And um, even here, she's, she's worked in molecular, molecular lab. Um, she's very, driven and open to, to many different opportunities. Unfortunately, so she worked with me from about 2019 until today, or, you know, <laughs> till soon. Um, you know, it was like these, th during the pandemic, so it was like our field of research opportunities were extremely limited compared to what they normally would be. But nevertheless, Alex got um, her research diver certification, and we, we <laughs> you know, we didn't get to go out on these blue water trips offshore with like, you know, glorious visibility for like 200 feet um, collecting things. But we did get a few very murky dives in the Monterey Bay um, off of our boat, the Paragon, just as like practice dives. So maybe I in the future we'll be able to get her out for a little bit more opportunity. Um, so in addition to all that scientific um, expertise, um, Alex is the only student I've had who is an aerial artist and so you can be you know we were walking down uh, the west side on santa cruz and who do we see hanging upside down in the sky from a silken rope but alex um, so she has many skills and abilities um, beyond science um, so today she's going to talk about what she's been working on um, using and she'll explain it better than i can but with these organisms called siphonophores and um, studying not just their abundance and distribution, but how they interact with, with their prey. Um, so, Alex. the culmination of more or less five years of work here, uh, both at Moss Landing and then at Mbari before that. Um, thanks for, you know, taking a break from your Cyber Monday shopping to join me. Um, I, uh, and thank you for being here. Uh, without that, we'll jump right into it. Uh, this thesis is entitled, The Feeding Habits and Selectivity of Siphonophores in Monterey Bay. A quick roadmap before we get started, I'm going to introduce my study system and then also my study species. Uh, I'm gonna talk about my three main objectives for this thesis and then I'm gonna go into them in more detail. Uh, I'll start with firstly talking about feeding and specialization and then I'll talk about selectivity and then I'll talk about phylogenetic relationships. And then I'll summarize that all into a broader discussion uh, and talk about some impacts of this work. So. This story takes place in the midwater environment. You can think of this as pretty much everything from the sea surface all the way down to the sea floor. It's this huge, vast, relatively stable 3D environment. All this stuff you see flying past the camera is mostly snot and schmutz. There are some animals mixed in, um, but you can think of it like this really big, vast 3D environment. The first 200 meters or so, uh, light can penetrate and you get photosynthesis, and then below that, the environment is mostly structured by oxygen, but it's very, very stable. 
Uh, I'm sure you guys have all heard the statistic that uh, the Earth is 70% ocean. Um, and this is true if you think about the Earth as like a flat 2D surface, but really, like I said, there's habitat that occurs from the sea surface all the way to the sea floor and everywhere in between. So if we assume that in a terrestrial environment, maybe 100 meters has, a, has habitable volume, and then for the ocean, it's everywhere from the surface all the way down to the sea floor, you actually find that 99% of habitable space on the planet is ocean by volume. And 93% of that is sort of deep pelagic ocean, ocean below that 200 meter threshold where photosynthesis can occur. Um, even though this is a really, really vast environment, it's incredibly understudied, it's really difficult to access. Um, we think there's plenty of new species there that are new to science, and this has led to it being dubbed biodiversity's big wet secret. Um, essentially, it's, it's this open question of what's down there and how this all works. What we do know is there's a really incredible variety of species there that we see nowhere else on the planet. Uh, we have anglerfish, we have vivid red shrimp and cephalopods. Uh, we have gelatinous organisms of all varieties um, that are just incredibly diverse. And what we know even less than what's there is how they actually relate to each other. That is the ecology of the system. Who eats who, who competes with who, how do they all interact in this environment? So as some of you guys may know, uh, we have a sort of golden opportunity to study the deep sea. Right behind us in Monterey Bay is the Monterey Bay Submarine Canyon. And this canyon is so deep that at its deepest it is deeper than the Grand Canyon. And it's one of the only places in the world that the deep sea occurs so close to shore. Because of this, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute has used remotely operated vehicles or ROVs to dive this canyon. We dive it all year round. Um, and while the ROV is in the water seeing whatever it sees, uh, we get to sit on this like very comfy climate controlled control room. Um, this is me and uh, one of my old lab mates, Aaron Schultz in the control room, watching that video screen uh, and essentially exploring this environment. When we get back to shore, all of that video is professionally annotated by taxonomists. Um, this makes this incredible data set one of the best long-term databases of midwater life. Um, it's a 30-year data set. It runs all the way back to when Ambari was founded in 1989. Um, it contains thousands upon thousands of hours of video, and then all of those annotations are coupled with depth information, time information, uh, information about the water quality and water parameters, um, and then any other annotations. You know, if we saw an animal eating something, if two animals interacted in some ways, this Really, really incredible data set. And, uh, and some work has already been done looking at feeding interactions in this data set, looking at the food web for it. Uh, this is a 2017 paper by uh, Anella Choi, a collaborator of ours. Uh, each of these nodes is a different group of animals, and then all of the lines between them is, uh, is a feeding observation. The thicker the line is, the more feeding observations we saw of one thing eating the other. And uh, for my study specifically, I wanted to focus in on all of these purple lines. These are generally siphonophores. And you'll notice right away that purple lines will spread all over this map. Siphonophores eat a ton of different things. And I wanted to understand that in a bit more detail. So here's what one of them looks like in action. Uh, you can see a whole bunch of swimming bells up in the front there. And then it's this long, long animal. And you'll also notice right away that there's tons of tentacles sticking out of this animal, just like a jellyfish. And that's, that's totally correct to think of it that way. These guys are related to jellies, and they have the same tentacles and stinging cells that jellies do. People ask me a lot, Alex, how big are siphonophores? Uh, the smallest are about four to six inches, and the longest will grow longer than a blue whale. So really incredible variety. This guy here in the video, I would say, looks more or less like this. For everybody on Zoom, I'm holding up a feather boa. I'd say maybe the one in the video is twice this length, but you can sort of imagine size and shape-wise it looks like this. So to orient you guys a little bit more with siphonophore anatomy, they all generally look like this. They may or may not have a gas-filled float at the very top of their body. And then they have a whole bunch of swimming bells that move the animal around. And then the rest of the body is a mishmash of a bunch of different things. They have bracts, which are sort of like padding. They have gonophores, which are reproductive organs. 
And then they have these gastrozoids, which is like a stomach with a tentacle attached to it. You can see that in a little more detail. You have this long tentacle, and along the tentacle, you have these little tentilla. Um, what's really cool is the tentilla have a really insane amount of variety if you look at its species by species. And these tentilla are generally adapted to feed upon different prey. Uh, there's some that are more piercing, which are better for catching fish. There's some that are more sort of entangling, which is better for catching a hard-bodied prey. And then some of them have just evolved to be smaller or less dense, and those are better for catching a small prey like a copepod. So you'll notice I said earlier, I was like, look at this food web, they eat all of these different things. And that's true, as a group, siphonophores eat a ton of different prey. But if you look at it species by species, uh, they're very, very picky in what they eat. And we actually see that. This is a 1980 study um, looking at the gut contents of different siphonophores. And you'll notice that Rhizophyza, out of all possible prey that we looked at, or that they looked at, only ate fish. 100% of its diet was fish. And then I have four other species that I've selected here that out of everything in the environment, they only ate copepods. So they can be incredibly, incredibly specialized on the species level in what they eat. I want to stop right here and make a distinction between specialization and selectivity. I'm gonna use both these terms quite a lot in this talk, and I wanna clarify right off the bat what I mean by them and how they are different. So when we talk about specialization, we're looking at the diet of a predator. We might say, oh, you know, this predator eats five different things, but it mostly eats this one thing, so it's specialized or somewhat specialized to eat that one thing that it eats the most of. And that's really good, that gives us really interesting information, um, but I think we get another perspective on that if we also consider what's in the predator's environment. So ambiently around it, what, it is, what is it going to run into the most often? What is in the prey field for that animal? And when we actually compare the amount of the diet versus the amount of environment, we might get some sort of interesting stories. Let's say that we see a predator mostly eat one type of prey, but then when we look at the environment, it doesn't actually run into that prey that often. That indicates that it's seeking out that prey in some way, i.e. it's eating it more frequently than it would just by random happenstance and randomly bumping into one another. And that kind of information is what we call selectivity. So to summarize, uh, specialization is the statistics that applies to just the predator looking at everything it eats. And then selectivity is a statistic that applies to a predator-prey pair, taking into account how frequently that prey is eaten and how frequently it's seen together. As a little proof of concept here, uh, this is a figure from a collaborator of mine, Liz Hetherington. Um, the top panel of this figure is a, is a literature review. It's uh, siphonophore feeding data from the literature. And then the bottom panel is selectivity for those same siphonophores. Um, each of these columns is a different species, and as sort of proof of concept of the difference between specialization and selectivity, I'll point to this guy way down at the end, uh, this succuleolaria. Um, you'll notice that when you're looking at the diet, uh, most of it is that green bar, and that corresponds to copepods. So succuleolaria eats mostly copepods. We might say it specializes on copepods. But when we look down at the selectivity information, copepods is this gray square and that corresponds to a selectivity of zero, i.e. it's eating copepods just as frequently as it run in, runs into them. It's sort of like at a neutral selection. In contrast, uh, this yellow bar up there is for ketognaths or an arrowworm. It eats much less ketognaths than it does copepods, but ketognaths have this dark black square and that corresponds to a stronger selectivity value. So even though Succulealaria eats less ketognaths per se, it's seeking them out. It's eating them at a much higher rate than it would just ambiently run into them. And this is sort of interesting if we imagine what would happen to Succulealaria if the abundance of ketognaths suddenly changed. This might have a greater impact on it than the abundance of copepods changing, even though it eats more copepods, because it's going out of its way. It's using energy to try to eat ketognaths. Another pattern here that I find really interesting in this figure uh, is you'll notice that this is grouped into sort of three broad columns, and these correspond to three broad groups of siphonophores. And there's really, really distinct feeding patterns between these three groups. The Systemex on the left here, if you look at their feeding data, it's all blue. They eat almost exclusively fish. Uh, you rarely see them eat anything else. 
And then on the other side, uh, on the right, we have calicochrins, and they're almost all green. They exclusively or almost exclusively eat copepods uh, with some variety in there. And then in the middle with the Physonex, uh, they tend to have pretty varied diets, but I'll point out that they all have a little orange bar in there, and that corresponds to other crustaceans. So no matter what we see Physonex eat, they almost always or always eat crustaceans. And then those sort of like genetic or phylogenetic patterns can hold on a smaller scale too. Um, I'll point out these two, Apollemia, right in the middle here. Uh, they're really closely related, and they're the only Physonex that eat anything gelatinous, which is that pink bar. Similarly, if we look at these two species of Agalma right next to them, uh, they eat different proportions of things, but they both eat the same three things, which is copepods, other crustaceans, and fish. So I sort of wondered if there might be some relationship between how closely related different siphonophores were and what they fed on. So to summarize this into three broad objectives for this study, there were three things I wanted to look at. Firstly, I wanted to investigate siphonophore feeding habits and report on specialization. Secondly, I wanted to calculate selectivity for each potential siphonophore and prey pair. And then lastly, I wanted to investigate any possible link between genetic relatedness and selectivity. So we did our introduction, we talked about our objectives, and now I'm gonna dive into these three smaller chapters. Okay, so, to do all these analyses, I use the BARS database. This is this video database I mentioned earlier, this massive multi-thousand hour database. Um, and I queried it for every single instance of a siphonophore eating any kind of prey. So siphonophore A eating prey X, siphonophore B eating prey Y, and so on and so forth. And then uh, these siphonophore and prey IDs were visually confirmed. Uh, if it was just an annotation and there wasn't an image, I went back through the database uh, and got a frame grab for it. Um, and then every single one of these frame grabs, uh, we had the IDs visually confirmed. I could not have done this without this absolute dream team of siphonophore experts. Um, thank you so much to Phil Pugh, Casey Dunn, Alejandro Damian Serrano, and Steve Haddock for helping me nail down all of these siphonophore and prey IDs. I'll also note right here, uh, we did this for every type of siphonophore except for Nanomia baduga. Stay tuned, I'll talk about why we didn't do it for Nanomia later. Okay, so when this was all said and done, we had a whole bunch of different types of prey. Um, we had so many that we decided uh, it would be best to group these into sort of broader functional groups, uh, those being gelata, sort of gelatinous animals, um, crustacea, crustaceans or hard-bodied animals, uh, another one for fishes, and then finally a fourth group for squid. Uh, for every analysis that I do past this point, I've done it twice, once at this sort of finer scale taxonomic ID level and once at a broader scale functional group level. So this is what the feeding data looks like. Um, we had 155 distinct feeding observations for 14 types of predators and 36 types of prey. Uh, I haven't included a legend for the different prey types in here, um, but just notice that Species by species, it's really variable. For some, that bar is all one color, and for some, the bar is like a whole bunch of different colors. They eat a bunch of different things. And then here's that same data grouped into broader functional groups. Um, again, there's some that it's, it eats mostly one thing, and some that it has sort of a greater variety. Um, but generally, I'll point out, uh, we can see apolemia, which is this like really tall bar that has a ton of different colors. When we look at it on a functional group level, it's mostly blue, and that corresponds to gelata. So even though apolemia eats a lot of things, it eats almost exclusively gelatinous things. So uh, given that data, I wanted to calculate diet specialization. The way I did that is by using the Shannon Index. The biologists in the audience may be familiar with this index. It's used frequently to look at diversity in an environment. Uh, it's used the exact same way here. It's just that we're looking at diversity within a, a predator feeding. So these are normalized. A value of one indicates it is the least specialized, and then a value of zero indicates that it's fully specialized. We only ever see it eat one thing. And here's what these data look like. Uh, 
a couple things I'll point out here. First is just how many zeros there are. Uh, essentially, how frequently we only see a cyclon if we're eating one thing, either on an individual level or on this broader functional group level, like I mentioned. We also have a bunch of instances here where uh, the individual number is uh, larger than the functional group number, and essentially that's indicating, like I said for aflemia earlier, it eats a lot of different things, but then they're all gelatinous things, um, or it eats a lot of different types of food, and then it's all fish. They sort of collapse down into these broader functional groups where it eats one kind of thing. So, great, we have our diet information. And now we want to combine that with our environment information to look at selectivity, like I mentioned earlier. There's a whole bunch of different indices you can use to do this. Uh, I chose to use an index called Strauss's Lee or Strauss's Linear Index or just Lee, which is really, really simple. It's just the proportion of a type of prey in the predator's environment, or excuse me, in the predator's diet, minus that same type of prey in the predator's environment. And this gives me an index that ranges from negative one, which indicates hard exclusion. We see it everywhere all the time, uh, but it's never in the predator's diet to a value of one, which is hard preference. Like, we barely ever see it, but wow, this predator still manages to seek it out and eat it all the time. So, how did I do that? I took my list of siphonophores and prey, I went back into the VARS database, and I got another data set. This data set is uh, every single instance of any time we saw any of the siphonophore predators or any time we saw any of the prey items. Um, not regardless of whether they were feeding or not, just any time we saw them. Uh, and then that goes through this really long and convoluted pipeline um, that I will not get into, um, but suffice to say most of the time working on this thesis is, is in that gray web right there. Um, and functionally what this gives us is two data sets. One is our feeding observation data set that I already mentioned that's gonna give us our proportion of prey in the predator's diet and then this occurrence data set, which is gonna give us our proportion of prey in the predator's environment. But how do we actually get from all of these occurrence data to a proportion? Uh, theory, theor theoretically, what's going on here is something like this. You can imagine that if you're looking at the abundance of a predator and a potential prey, uh, here we've got depth on the y-axis and then a proxy for abundance rate, rate of sighting on the x-axis. Uh, there's going to be some area between them where they overlap, which I've shown in blue here. And that area of overlap is a proxy for how frequently this predator and prey might run into each other in the environment. And then uh, just for posterity, we might imagine that somewhere within this blue area, we actually have some sort of feeding observation of, in this case, a Maris eating a cyclophony. I'll also note here that I'm displaying this uh, just as depth because it's simpler, but in reality when I did this calculation, I did it over depth and over time of year. A lot of predators and prey in the study have pretty distinct seasonal cycles, and so I felt that if I wanted to capture how frequently they might run into each other over the course of the year, I wanted to include that seasonal information. So you can imagine this instead of like two 1D arcs, more like a 2D surface in the different places where they overlap. The actual equation I used to calculate this looks like this. Um, I will go through this quickly. The details of it are not especially important if you are not a math person, but, um, but just to note like a few big things here. Uh, these n terms, it's the proportion of one type of prey versus every type of prey, and then that j is in a certain depth and time bin. These d terms are, uh, are the same but for the predator, the proportion of a predator in that depth and time bin. And then I have these two T terms, and the T terms are a time correction. Um, we, the, the data set exists year round, but we spend way more time collecting and sampling in, uh, in the spring, excuse me, in the summer and fall because the conditions are calm. And then we spend way more time in the first 1,000 meters of the water column versus anything below that. So to correct for these things, uh, I wanted to add this time correction to sort of even out that sampling. And yes, for the math people in the audience, I know I know this collapses down to this form. Um, I'm just showing the full form because I think the components are easier to understand. But yes, yes I know. Um, after I did that, I tested for significance for each predator-prey pair that had sufficient feeding observations. So essentially, uh, sufficient feeding observations above this threshold and the sufficient environment observations above that second threshold. For every predator-prey pair that had sufficient observations, 
I did a two-tailed one-sample p-test, essentially looking at whether that selection was significantly positive or significantly negative. So all said and done, that data looks like this. Uh, I have my predators along the y-axis, and then all of my different types of prey along the x-axis. Uh, my broad groups are over here on the left, and then those broad groups are broken down into individual concepts on the right. The stronger the color blue, the stronger the positive selection, and the stronger the color red, the stronger the negative selection. I also have a whole bunch of different uh, of these cross-hatched squares. These are no data. Essentially, these are predator-prey pairs where there was no environmental overlap. So obviously, if there's no overlap, you, one can't be selecting for the other. Something I'll point out here is um, if you read in rows across, there tend to be two or three blue squares matched. Uh, generally, siphonophores tend to be selective, and they tend to be selective for one or two prey or like one or two types of prey. Um, there's not like a whole lot of blue squares in a row. Of all of these, uh, these little green squares indicate predator-prey pairs where I could test for significance. I had two for Lychnogalma up on the top, six for Apollemia, and then three for Priodubia on the bottom. And these are what those significance tests look like. Uh, I've color-coded them by the same colors we used before. The more blue it is, the stronger the positive selection. The more red it is, the stronger the negative selection. White is neutral. And then if the significance test was significant, uh, I've left it as that color. If it wasn't significant, I've grayed it out. So for Lichnogalma, uh, it was significantly positively selective for the shrimp, Eusergestes, and for decapods more generally. For Priodubia here, it was significantly positively selective for gelatinous stuff, and significantly negatively selective for crustaceans, and not significant for krill. For Athlemia, uh, we got to test a whole bunch of different things. It has significant positive selection for salps and gelatinous stuff, uh, new, neutral selection for paraphyla, the coronate jelly, and for krill. No significance for leptophecates, which is this group of jellies, and then significant negative selection for krill, or excuse me, for crustaceans more generally. So last thing I wanted to do is I wanted to look at these genetic relationships that I was talking about earlier. To do this, I used this 18S tree uh, provided to me by my advisor, Steve, thank you. Um, and I pared this down to just the species that were in my study. This is everything in my study except for my undescribed Physonex Z, which wasn't in this tree. So it's one less species than everything I've talked about thus far. I paired this with that selectivity data that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and the way that I put these together is like so, for the trees, I, did, I looked at pairwise branch lengths. So essentially, for every pair of predators, I trace back in the tree until I found a common node, and I take that distance and I divide it by two. And that's a proxy for how closely related any two species are. And then for my selectivity data, I did the same thing. I would compare every possible pair of two species, and I would take every selectivity value that I calculated for each of those. Um, it's Euclidean distance, which is actually a really cool thing. So if you imagine you're comparing two numbers, if you want the distance between them, you put one on the x-axis and one on the y-axis, and your distance is just that hypotenuse. It's just a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And then this is extracted to, uh, or extrapolated to, uh, to every single pair for every single prey atom that I looked at. And then I'm getting a number, and that's the comparison of how different to, uh, to selectivity, two groups of selectivity are between predators. So that looks like this. So uh, we have genetic distance on the x-axis, and then that feeding dissimilarity on the y-axis, and each of those dots is a predator-predator pair. Um, so the first thing you'll notice is just how, uh, how spread out these data are. Uh, the trend is significant. There is a significant positive trend that the further related two species are, the more dissimilar their diets are. But, um, but the R-squared value is really low. It's 0 0.13, so only 13% of the variability in these data is explained by that positive trend. OK, great. So I talked about my three objectives, uh, and now I'm going to wrap this up in a discussion and talk about some broader impacts of this work.
So first, I looked at feeding and specialization, like I said. And generally, you see this pattern where even if on an individual level, an animal eats more than one type of prey, when you look at it in a broader feeding build context, it sort of collapses down to zero. For bathy phyza specifically, uh, we saw it eat multiple kinds of fish, but we only saw it eat fish. So when we look at it in that larger group, it's a, it's a zero because it's just eating fish. For, ap for uh, apolemia, like I said, we saw a similar thing. It eats a ton of gelatinous stuff, but it's still all gelatinous stuff. So when we get to a higher group level, that number collapses down a bit from a one to a 0 0.76. The other really cool thing I noticed in these feeding data uh, for apolemia specifically is we saw it eating both salps and then also uh, oikoplura and bathycordius, which are both um, which are both larvations. What's really cool about these guys is they are very involved in carbon sequestration and carbon cycling. Essentially, there's a lot of little mucus and pieces of carbon floating around in the midwater, and these guys will eat it and package it and export it. So. If apolemia eats a lot of salps and eats a lot of larvations, they potentially also have a big role in these global carbon cycles and carbon sequestration. It would be something that would be really cool to look at and think about maybe in a future study. Okay, uh, and then we looked at our selectivity. Um, I said the last time I showed you guys this figure, you'll notice that there's only one or two, maybe three max of these blue squares per row, per predator. Um, but then the other, the flip side of that is most of these squares are white, right? Most of these squares indicate neutral selectivity. So if we're taking all these values and we're turning it into a distribution, it looks like this. Um, you get this spike right at zero because most of these predator prey pairs we looked at had neutral or almost neutral selectivity. I've also color coded these data by whether we saw feeding for that specific predator prey pair. And you'll notice that there's a long tail going up to one with these tiny little orange dots for uh, these predator prey pairs for which there was feeding and there was strong selection. And then there's a little bit of a tail going the other way for these predator prey pairs where there was strong negative selection. But even, uh, even when there's feeding, it tends to cluster around zero. So to me, this indicates that siphonophores tend to prefer to feed on things that are in their direct environment rather than things that are uh, really hard to get or you really have to seek out in some way. So uh, thirdly, talking about phylogenetic distance, like I said, there was a positive trend, but it was a really weak positive trend. Um, one of the reasons I think this might be is because of the morphology of siphonophores themselves. This is a paper, uh, this is a figure from a paper from one of my collaborators, Alejandro Damian Serrano. Um, and this is a tree that he reconstructed and then color-coded based on predicted feeding yields for various siphonophores. And he made these predictions looking at just the tentilla morphology that I mentioned earlier, that huge variety in those nematocyst batteries. Um, and something I'll point out here, sort of the, the punchline of this to me, is uh, you get these really distinct switches between what these siphonophores feed on as you go through this tree. So I'll point out apolemia here. Uh, in my study, apolemia eat, uh, ate gelatinous food. And, and here, too, uh, apolemia is a gelatinous specialist. But its common ancestor, if you trace it back in the tree, was a large crustacean specialist. So there was an animal that ate large crustaceans. Some evolutionary thing happened. And then it ate gelatinous stuff with no sort of intermediate uh, generalist stuff. And you see this all over the tree. I'll point out another one here. This is cortigalma. Uh, cortigalma eats small crustaceans, it's specialist on small crustaceans, but its common ancestor ate large crustaceans. And there's these very sudden and distinct switches. Uh, sort of the tagline is specialists can evolve into specialists, right? So if there was an animal where uh, how closely related they were didn't really have that much of, of an effect on how similar their feeding was, it makes sense that it would be a siphonophore because they just have these intensely modular body plans and then can do these really distinct and sudden uh, diet switches that you don't see in a lot of other animals. The other thing uh, I want to point out in terms of phylogenetic distance is this is a figure from, uh, from my collaborator, Liz Hetherington, uh, looking at siphonophore feeding relationships uh, with their prey, and she split it into shallow and deep habitat. Shallow is this, uh, these two columns on the left, deep habitats are these two columns on the right. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of statistics here. She essentially looked at a whole bunch of food web statistics. Um, the ones I'll point out specifically, uh, one is nestedness. Uh, shallow habitats are less nested than deep habitats. So 
there's less redundancy in those predator-prey relationships in deep habitats. And then also, uh, deep habitats tend to be more specialized than shallow habitats. Essentially, what this indicates to me is that um, these feeding differences that we see, these really distinct feeding differences, uh, could essentially be more due to niche partitioning than actual phylogenetic relatedness. So it's much more a function of whether you live shallow or deep and who you're competing with in your direct environment for food rather than how related you are to that competitor. Okay, uh, to finish this off, I'd be amiss if I didn't talk about a few specific stories that I find really interesting in this data set. One is uh, the story of Lichnogama utricularia. Uh, I mentioned this one, this cyclonophore briefly earlier for, uh, for selecting for Eusergestes similis, this shrimp. You can actually see in this photo on the left, uh, there's this big orange thing in the tail and that is a Eusergestes shrimp that it's caught. That shrimp is not having a good day. Um, and Lichnogama really, really, really intensely selects for Eusergestes. Uh, not only was it the only siphonophore in the study to eat Eusergestes, uh, we saw it eating Eusergestes 18 times. Um, it, we did see like Nagalma eating other things. You can actually see in the photo to the right, if you have good eyes, there's a krill that's caught in that, in that like Nagalma. It does eat krill, it does eat some other things, but by and away, it really, really likes to eat Eusergestes. Um, like Nagalma also has really distinct uh, lures on their tentilla. They float which uh, even when you're looking at black and white imagery, you can see it really clearly. They, they move in these really weird floaty ways that I, I don't see in other tentella. So I think probably this lure is specially adapted to attract Eusergestes specifically. Also, if you look at the distribution of Lichnogalma, um, I have depth on the y-axis here and then diverging on the x-axis is rate of sighting, sort of a proxy for abundance. Uh, Lichnogalma uh, in red here falls really, really squarely inside Eusergestes similis' depth distribution. And not just the depth distribution generally, but actually it falls squarely inside sort of the peak abundance for Eusergestes similis. Which makes sense if you imagine you mostly want to eat this one specific thing. You want to hang out where you're gonna see it the most frequently. Second, I wanna talk about apolemia. Um, this photo on the left here is my favorite photo in this entire study. Uh, this apolemia has caught a solmesis jelly so large it can't even fit it in its gastrozoid. It is it's like such a crazy photo to me. Um, and then on the right, there's another apolemia that's caught in Atola jelly. Um, apolemia, like I've said many times, uh, eats a ton of gelatinous prey. We saw it eat a ton of different things. And because it ate so many things, we got to test for significance uh, with a ton of different predator prey pairs. So you guys saw this earlier, uh, apolemia is positively selective for gelatinous stuff and for salps, uh, significant for paraphyla and krill, and then has this negative selection for crustacea. The cool thing uh, actually is we do see apolemia eating krill, and, we, and krill is a crustacean, but it's just that krill is so much more abundant compared to how frequently we see apolemia eat it that it's like, well, it isn't selecting that strongly for it. It's actually negatively selective for it. Um, to zero in on salps a little bit, like I said, salps are really big carbon cyclers, and when we compare apolemia's depth distribution to salps, um, it's really impressive to me how closely they match up. Again, this is apolemia on the left in pink, and salps on the right in blue, and it's, it, that depth distribution is just always so impressive to me because it's so close to a one-to-one -one distribution. Um, it's almost, it almost looks like a vase to me. Um, which again makes sense. If you're in apolemia and you're really trying to select for salps, you wanna hang out exactly where salps are the most abundant. Um, and then to finish off, I'd be amiss to not talk about the Nanomia and krill story. So Nanomia bejuga is a siphonophore that is really, really common in Monterey Bay. It is literally so common that the common name is the common siphonophore. Um, and they eat krill. Uh, like I pointed out in the feeding data earlier, um, there's this huge pink bar and it's all krill. Uh, we saw Nanomia eating krill 43 times in the study and krill are obviously also incredibly common. They'll swarm, they have these huge blooms. Um, and we see Nanomia eating things all the time. Um, They're actually so commonly seen eating things that there's a concept in the video lab database called Nanomia 2, which is Nanomia that is eating something. Um, the reason that we didn't dig in and, uh, and get a frame grab for every single instance of Nanomia eating something 
is simply because of the 43 frame grabs we had, they were all Krill. And so we sort of assumed that even if we went through and got all these frame grabs, which would be a whole lot more work, it would still just kind of be Krill all the way down. The other thing about this that's interesting is, uh, you know how I talked about this equation earlier, which is our minimum sample size to test for significance? Um, you'll notice I didn't say anything about nanomia being significantly selected for krill. And that's actually because it only eats krill. Um, as that proportion of prey in the environment or in the diet hits one, as it eats uh, exclusively one thing, the number of feeding observations you need to, uh, to, t to assume normality and to be able to apply the statistical test uh, reaches infinity. So actually, because it is so picky and so selective, we can't even test for significance. To me, I like to think of this as like we can do a between the eyes test, which is the pattern is so clear it hits you between the eyes, right? Like it, it only eats krill. We know it only eats krill. Um, it is likely very selective for krill. Um, something else I'll note is uh, krill tends to bloom in the summer, and nanomia has this very clear and distinct fall bloom. Um, also makes sense if you're eating krill and the krill population blooms in the summer, it makes sense that the nanomia population would bloom in the fall following that seasonal bloom. Uh, and then the last thing I'll note about this is uh, as krill vertically migrates and nanomia also vertically migrates, nanomia is one of the only siphonophores that we know has this apical pore in the top of that float that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I think this likely allows it to undergo these large deal vertically deal vertical migrations that other siphonophores might not be able to. I think this is very likely to track krill and to catch krill, um, but this is, this is a topic for future study that I think would be really interesting to look at. Okay, a few caveats and considerations of this study. First off, uh, our OV data really struggles to observe small things like copepods. You'll notice that uh, I talked a lot about copepods in my introduction and then pretty much never mentioned them again. Uh, the reason for that is because it's really hard to see a copepod uh, on a video screen. If it's totally likely they're there, I'm absolutely convinced that they're being eaten by siphonophores, but it's just sort of outside the scope of the study to actually see the krill, or excuse me, see the copepods and to, to make those feeding observations and conclusions about it. So assume it's happening, it's just outside the scope of the study. Uh, another thing to mention is ROV attraction or avoidance. Uh, the ROV is a really incredible tool, but it is big and it swirls the water around. It has these huge bright floodlights. And depending what kind of animal you are, especially if you're an animal that has a lot of swimming capacity like a fish, you're probably gonna be very turned off by this and you're gonna swim away and we're just never gonna see you or we're not gonna see you nearly as frequently as you're actually there. Conversely, squid are attracted to lights, right? So. Uh, we have, we've had plenty of times where we're uh, looking at the ROV from the control room and there's just, there's just squid. There's squid following us all, all up and down. So, um, so these sorts of behaviors likely inflate or deflate artificially our, our abundances in the environment. So that's something to consider. Third, uh, I talked about these sort of seasonal changes in abundance of different animals. Um, it's really, really hard to differentiate tree changes in abundance versus just advection of different water masses over the same point. With uh, terrestrial stuff, it's pretty easy, and if you're looking at something on the ground, it's pretty easy, because we know that always stays in the same spot. But, uh, but the open ocean is always in flux. Um, we know that we dive the same latitude and longitude very consistently, but um, it's hard to say whether there's actual a true change in abundance going on or if it's just a different water mass coming in that has more or less of that animal over the same spot. So maybe we can think of this less as, a, as like selectivity and feeding behavior of siphonophores and more like selectivity of feeding behavior in siphonophores in Monterey Bay specifically. So uh, to summarize my objectives, first I wanted to look at siphonophore feeding habits and report on specialization which I did, they eat a ton of different things, but when we look at it in functional groups, they tend to collapse down a bit. Second, I wanted to calculate selectivity for each siphonoform prey pair. I did that, this is the fourth time you guys are seeing this figure. I love this figure. Um, we, we saw strong selection for certain things and generally neutral selection across the board. And then I wanted to look at this link between genetic relatedness and selectivity. And there was a link, there was a significant trend um, but I just don't think it's sort of the driving force of the story. So uh, to conclude, why does this matter? Um, like I said in the introduction, the steep pelagic habitat is the vast majority of habitable space on the planet. 
yet it is easily the most understudied ecosystem on the planet. And the more we understand these trophic connections, uh, we get to trace energy flow through the system. Uh, like I said, we get to trace carbon flow too, as, uh, as some of these animals really repackage carbon and allow it to sequester. And we get to link otherwise disparate organisms. Um, I mean, I certainly, before I started this project, would never consider uh, jellies to eat fish, right? Um, but if you study fish, suddenly you're thinking, oh, well, like they, do siphonophores eat them? Is that a prey, you know, for, for this other thing? So we get to make all of these really cool and interesting connections um, and in this like huge environment. So with that, I'll move into my acknowledgements. Um, first off, an incredible, incredible thank you to Steve Haddock for enabling this work and taking me on board and allowing me to do this project. Um, I actually met Steve at a really interesting time in my life. I knew I wanted to be a marine scientist. I'd always wanted to be a marine scientist. Um, but I was, uh, I was like halfway through my undergrad and I was falling more and more in love with programming. Um, I really liked to code. I liked how technical it was. And I was sort of at this crossroads. I was like, maybe, maybe I don't want to do the marine science thing. I don't know what I'm doing here. Maybe I want to do the programming thing instead. Um, and my, the PhD student I was working for at the time, she's like, hey, you know, this, this guy's giving a talk. You should come see this guy give a talk. And, I, and it was Steve Haddock. I saw him talk uh, for, for the grad students at UCSC. Um, and he said something. He said, I think more scientists need to know how to code. I think we need to empower scientists to also be able to program. And it really, it was like a switch went off. It really gave me permission to do the kind of work I wanted to do that I didn't even know existed at that point. So thank you for allowing me to do this work, for, for changing the course of my life in these major ways. I am I'm so incredibly grateful for everything you've done. Second to Amanda Kahn, um, Amanda and I actually knew each other uh, before she started here. We met at, a, at an Ambari barbecue when she was a postdoc and I was a research tech. Uh, and we sat on the curb and ate like uh, burgers or whatever it was. And I said, oh, I might want to go to grad school. I don't know. I'm not sure. And, um, and then when I decided I did want to go, it was, it, she was like a really obvious first pick to go, hey, you know, I think I want to do this thing. Can I, can I join your lab? And she was so on board and so helpful from day one. So thank you so much to, to Amanda. And then to Corey Garza and to Con Tom Connolly, thank you so much for your insightful comments and support and, and cheering me on from day one. Um, I, I could not have done it without you, either of you, genuinely. Um, and then I, this would be amiss to not give a special shout out to one of my collaborators, Alejandro Damian Serrano, who was so, so incredibly helpful with this project, helping me get my questions straight, helping me figure out how to even think about all these concepts. Um, we used to sit down all the time and go back and forth and, oh, what about this? How do I calculate like that? Um, this project absolutely would not have been possible without you. So thank you, Alejandro. Uh, and then I'll generally extend thanks to all the members of the Haddock Lab, the Khan Lab, and the Garza Lab for your support, for hearing me talk about siphonophores over and over and over and over, and talk about data over and over and over and over, um, and just really, really being such a wonderful community for me. Um, to the Ambari Video Lab for, cur for curating this insane database, an insane resource, and all of the time and work it takes to do that. Um, I am not kidding when I say that we have barely scratched the surface of the sort of questions we can answer with these data. So I am, I'm just so incre incredibly grateful that this data set exists and that this resource exists to be able to do this kind of work. And then finally, to MLML faculty, staff, and students, anyone that I've ever had a class with, done a project with, um, special shout out to Tara Egging, who I don't see right now, but um, just absolute superstar of an administrator who I, I, I would not have made it through this program without her help. Um, thank you, thank you to everyone, and uh, also to everyone I've ever gotten to go on a research cruise with. Um, by far the coolest part of this job is these opportunities to get out on the ocean, sit in the control room, sort of see real time as the ROV moves through the environment, um, and it's just been so inspiring and so allowed me to get my head on straight when thinking about all these concepts. So thank you to, to the marine ops crew, to the engineering crew, to everyone who makes these cruises possible. And finally, I want to extend a thank you to, to generally my community, um, all of the people in my life who have inspired me and cheered me on and run around with me and had fun with me and, and been goofy with me. Um, I, I treasure and value you, you all so much and would not have made it through this program without your support. <laughs>
And that, uh, that's it. I'll say thanks, and I'll open the floor to questions. Suggested that highly selective siphonophores expand, expend extra energy to target their prey in, prey. in what forms do you think this energy is spent? Bioluminescence, striking poses, pursuit. Mm. What does, what, how do you think that impacts the investigator? That's an interesting question. Um, my first thought is, uh, is I've said that siphonophores tend to have these lures that are, that are probably specialized to seek out whatever kind of prey they're trying to get. Um, frequently, those lures are not passively sitting there. They're twitching, they're moving around. Um, there's some active energy movement cost to, to trying to go, hey, I'm over here, you know, look at me, come, come bite me. So that's the first thing I would think of in terms of expended energy. Um, also, in the case of something like the Manonia, where they're potentially birds and migrating to track trail, obviously that's a huge energy expenditure, especially for a small animal to undergo these huge distances day and night. question. Uh, I didn't mention this in the talk, but um, the ROV data is pretty much limited to daytime. Uh, more or less, the ROV goes in the water at like 6 or 6.30 a.m. and comes up at 6 or 6.30 p.m. Um, with a few exceptions, but for this study, it was really just constrained to daytime. Um, I, I think that like the nighttime aspect is a whole other question. It's super interesting. Um, it's actually been demonstrated for some siphonophores that they tend to feed more at day or at night. There are sort of deal patterns to it. Um, but it's just, for this, it's just sort of focused on the daytime feeding. So it seems like um, this data would have a lot of implications for modeling of the midwater food web. Uh, can you comment on whether you think modelers would have to account for all these different types of siphonophores, or would it be possible to lump them in as a siphonophore group? Uh, great question. Um, I mean, I, my first answer is it depends on it depends on how how accurate your model needs to be. Um, I talked a little bit about differences between sort of shallow and deep siphonophore feeding. So depending on your accuracy, you might be able to clump them into sort of like shallow siphonophores feed on these things and deep siphonophores feed on these things. Um, but it would only be more accurate to at least pair them down to sort of smaller genus level groups. Um, any group that you know feeds really specifically on one type of prey or another would make it, make it a much more accurate model. Alex, great job. I, ha I have lots, but I'll keep most for, for later. But this one, I just, I think it would be interesting. I'm, I'm curious about sort of the, the thought experiment of like, what do you think the ecological significance is of the non-selected prey? Like, do you think there would be a way to approach, you know, if something is selecting, is it getting more of its food energy from that? What proportion of its total energy budget might come from that food source? How do you think you, these data could contribute to something like that? And what else would you need? So you're asking, um, there's prey that siphonophores select for and prey that they, they are like mutually selective for, and which is which is a greater proportion of that siphonophore's energy budget? Yeah, yeah. Well, if they're not selecting, they're Sure, yes. <laughs> yeah, so if they're, if they're not selecting for it, but like the, the krill example, right? Mm -hmm. There was one that had a really big krill food budget, but yeah. then ketic gnats were the selected right. target. So um, you know, krill might still be a really ecologically or energetically important component of the diet of the siphonophore. Mm -hmm. 
but isn't selected. So I guess, you know, can you think about what some of the trade-offs might be for a siphonophore being too much of a specialist versus eating what's there? And yeah, I mean, um, sort of the tricky thing here is uh, we, we say that siphonophores are neutrally selective for a prey if they eat at the same rate as it encounters in their environment, but, um, but it's not like we can really go in the environment and change these things, right? Like maybe if there were less copepods in Seculiolaria's environment, they would still eat just as many copepods and we'd still get, we'd start to get this strong positive selection signal for copepods. Um, something else to think about would be, I mean, the, the Keating F example is interesting to me because gelatinous animals are not generally considered to be very nutrient dense, you know? So it's like, if they're selecting for heating nets, uh, there's got to be a good reason for it. I would guess that it's uh, it goes back to this thing I was talking about with niche space, right? There's there's an open niche space there, and so they're taking advantage of that to feed them nasty because they're not being eaten by a lot of other things. Um, oh, there's so many ways I could go with this question. <laughs> there's so many little things I could I could say, but um, I know I saw a question in the back here that I want to get to. There are two questions in the back. <laughs> Are there conditions that promote or inhibit populations for both the siphonophores and the prey? Mm. And do you think that opens up just opportunistic feeding? Yeah, I, I don't know if opportunistic feeding. Um, to some extent, I'd say yes, right? Like I had this example of apolemia, which eats mostly gelatinous things, but it does eat krill. Right, like if if it really you know ensnares a krill or comes across a krill, it'll eat it. It'll catch it. Um, but oh, there's another claw in there, and it just bit it off. Um, Yeah, well, I mean, um, I think you definitely see that. I wouldn't say that necessarily predators and prey are being attracted to the same thing, but, um, but when I was talking about those depth distributions earlier, right, like uh, the prey have some depth distribution and then the predators are just gonna totally lock into that or map it because they wanna hang out where that prey is the most abundant. Um, and then I just, I really think for nanomia, um, if there was some way that you'd be able to track the uh, the vertical distribution of those on a finer scale, you'd see a similar sort of pattern where like wherever the krill is more abundant, the nanomia are tracking it in some way or another. Um, I, I would love to have looked at that. Uh, vertical migration of krill is, is incredibly complex and I assume it is for nanomia too. It's, it was just sort of outside the scope of this data set. So I had a, um, a, qu a similar question about sort of like prey tracking and stuff, which mm -hmm. is you mentioned that siphonophores seem to have pretty distinct seasonality. Do, did you notice um, and that the siphonophores with, um, that were more specialized to one kind of prey had like more distinct seasonality than generalists or, were, were, or was there no pattern or not enough data to really get into that? Um, to be honest, it's not something I really looked at outside of nanomia until. Um, a lot of siphonophores, I, I mean, Anomia has a very distinct seasonal abundance trend. Um, a lot of siphonophores don't. Um, or maybe they do, but they just, we don't see them frequently enough to really get a lock on that. And Anomia is really easy because we have a lot of data for it. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting to think about. Hi, Stav, Alex. Um, do you think that the size of the siphonophore determines like what is worth catching for them? Like you would think that one thing might be like the most energetically dense, but since they're all selecting for different stuff, do you think the size of the actual siphonophore determines what they're like able to catch maybe? Totally, I mean, um, siphonophores are pretty fragile. Uh, one of the reasons it's so useful to use ROVs to look at them is because they don't hold up in a net. So if you do a net tow, you know that you caught a siphonophore, but it's in pieces. You can't really do anything with it. Um, 
So it's absolutely reasonable to imagine that um, that if it caught a fish or something that was too big or too powerful, that it would be damaging to the animal. Um, but then, you know, if it eats fish, like fish start out small, right? There's a larval form. So there's, I think there's probably plenty of cases where they're feeding on like a smaller version of larvae. Thank you. Hey Alex, good talk. Um, I have a you mentioned like advection of populations and stuff, and like more physical parameters. Um, is there any like, could you mention any other physical influences on like population measurements and like where the ROV is going if if it's in the middle of like a gyre and they're like collected, versus and also like any vertical uh, distribution. Like for example, you have the oxygen minimum zone. Um, are they just like sitting there waiting for, you know, depth migration and stuff like that? Anyway. Yeah, I, um. Sorry if I didn't catch that. No, 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 there's a, there's a few different things here. Uh, one is that uh, I mentioned that you sort of only get sunlight penetration for the first 200 meters or so. Um, also, as you go deeper, the environment gets more stable. So like the, the upper, 200 to 1,000 meters is way more variable. There's way more seasonal influence, and then the deeper environment is, is much more stable. Um, so you, you totally get different population effects there, um, just in terms of like depth. Um, and then this is, uh, this is more conjecture, but um, there's actually a lot of diversity in cyclonic low feeding posture. So Apollonia, we tend to see sitting in this big, wide, flat spiral. And my feeling is, uh, is this to catch vertical migrators, right? You're maximizing your TV surface area. So you're sort of creating this net that things can fall through. Um, but the actual data behind that remains to be seen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We had um, Greg Kaye online had a, a comment that I think probably summarizes what a lot of us think. Um, he says, it's amazing what can now be done with what I used to call UFOs, unidentified floating objects in the old days. Congrats to Abby adding much needed data and trophic interactions to the gelatinous mesoflash of fauna. Talk was well done, and I enjoyed it very much. Oh, thank you, so Greg. <laughs> let's thank Alex. Um, so congratulations to Alex on a very nice job. Um, I guess, can I encourage people to Yeah, eat, drink, and be merry. Eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> Um, before you um, tackle the, those first three platters, take a note of their morphology 